Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. Today is uh, the second Sunday in Lent, March 13th, 2022. And our first reading is Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, and then 17 through 11. Our psalm is 27. Our second reading is Philippians 3, chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. And our gospel returns us to Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. Our second Sunday in Lent. And we've jumped ahead a few verses in the gospel of Luke. Yeah, well, and it, but again, this is a text that we, we mentioned last week, the way in which the, the devil disappearing for an opportune time sets up an important idea in Luke's gospel. And now here's a place where maybe not for the first time, I think maybe Luke 9 does this, but here we've got a sense of the looming importance of the city of Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, which will come back into play when we get to Holy Week for sure but also deserves some mention here and, and probably will, will matter as well when we get to the, the ordinary time part of this, this current year, that Jerusalem has this kind of collective characterization when it comes to, to Luke and also the book of Acts in terms of how the gospel understands the responsibility for Jesus' death. That, so this idea of it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> I'm sure people get a figure to that. I think what he's saying is it's impossible for him. I mean, he's talking about a divine plan working itself out, but he describes Jerusalem as the city that kills the prophets, which in some ways is unfair historically, but it's, again, he's setting up this, this kind of archetype of um, a prophet rejected in his hometown back in chapter four. Uh, and now this idea of a prophet going to the most dangerous place for a prophet to speak a message. And course, it's not entirely true, but Luke will also invite us, and the book of Acts will invite us in its earliest chapters to imagine all of Jerusalem bearing some kind of culpability for his crucifixion, which, uh, so you have to kind of pull people into that. Jeremy Williams does a really good job describing how we have to do that without slipping into an anti-Semitism that says, you know, all Jews killed Jesus or something ridiculous like that. But uh, but I think the, the, the challenge for a preacher is to Kind of extend the boundaries of Jerusalem and help us imagine what does that mean for us or what does it imagine for Jesus to be killed not just by a couple of bad actors or bad authorities but really to enter into a climate of of um, of opposition and and to and to characterize that climate of opposition as largely one controlled by people by religious people a lot of religious people with a lot at stake in their own theological systems and, and ways of being religious, uh, but also people with a lot of privilege and a lot to lose and, and people who feel like they're holding on to a tradition that's it's under siege from a lot of different directions. And just to kind of talk a bit about um, what does this mean for us as churches and what does this mean for us to continue to live into that liberative uh, aspect of Jesus' message, which is also very much a, a critical message. And, it's, and it tends to be critical toward religious authorities or religious insiders, 
which are the four of us on the screen, those of you lucky enough to be watching us on YouTube, um, but it's also the people you're preaching to probably on a Sunday morning, at least most of them. Yeah, I think too, in in relationship to that, I mean, we were talking about this last week with regard to the ordering of the of the tests or the temptations and that Jerusalem ends up being the final one because for Luke, Jerusalem does represent, is really its own character uh, in many respects. And the way here, and, and you might, a preacher might want to hold together also next week where you have the parable of the barren fig tree that one of the, you go back and in, in back in chapter 13, but this really calling attention to what is this obedience or what is this, you know, what is, what does obedience to God look like? What does identity to God look like? And, or I, I, having an identity with God look like, and then how is it that a larger, you know, the larger Luke and theme of, do you see as God sees? And, uh, and the, the fact that, you know, to recognize too, that we're, Jesus has set his face to face to Jerusalem, right? This this nine fifty one is where we is in that larger, uh, that larger uh, travel narrative, right to Jerusalem, and and it takes him ten chapters to get to Jerusalem, and so Jerusalem is always present, and uh, and that in verse thirty three. Uh, yet, yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, uh, the, you know, the translation is I must be, but the, but the uh, translation is, uh, the word there is day, it's necessary for him, that this is, that, that we see this as a, as a fulfillment of his obedience, a fulfillment of that, of that testing back in chapter four of who, who he is and who he came for, and this act of obedience, and this, and, and that this, the lament for Jerusalem is the way in which, again, yeah, not, not, this is not, you know, not for uh, all Jews, that's not it, but it's the way in which the representation of, of religiosity or the, the representation of uh, power and authority in that particular location also is not able to see uh, or is resistant to if you take seriously the 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 image in the latter part of the passage is resistant to uh, the the image of God bringing together God's chicks underneath uh, for protection. Uh, and so it's uh, it, it, there's there's also that resistance there, too, of who is it that who is it that God is for and what is God up to? Well, and what's the risk that he's not just walking into a snake pit? I don't think Luke views it as that. I mean, he'll he'll weep over the city in chapter nineteen. There's a sense of that he's going to a place that that is that is vulnerable that that needs <laughs> that needs this prophetic voice that needs to be set free. And so, to even to describe them here as 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 baby chicks and the and the image of a of a mother hen is probably a lot more ferocious than a lot of us imagine. Um, Right, I don't usually think of a hen as the most. I think it's one. It's one of the few things in the animal kingdom I could probably, I could probably fight and and and, and beat. Um, I couldn't do that with an eagle or a hawk or other thing. Maybe it depends on how big the chicken was. But you're getting, yeah, uh, you're going to get email on that one. Probably, I'm probably going to lose to most of the animal kingdom. But anyway, my point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had a point somewhere. Yeah, that that, uh, and it's out of compassion. He doesn't. He's gonna say some horrible things <laughs> about about his opponents, um, but it's a it's a it's a it's a prophetic criticism meant to redeem and meant to save and correct and protect. Aren't we often uh, our most uh, hurtful of others, uh, most harmful toward others when we ourselves are most vulnerable? And that juxtaposition, juxtaposition that you're describing there, I think is real important to hold on to, is not just to say these are the bad guys, but to say these are the folks that Jesus loves so much. And to hold that intention, because that's they are us in our, our every moment along our journey where we need and in that need, we may swing out. Uh, I it, it, to totally make this ridiculous. Um, uh, Sunday, I I preached at a church, and and when I was getting out of the car, the pastor had come around to help me out of the car. And as a single woman, I'm very unused to that. 
And so I swung just to get myself out of the car and nearly took him out. So here he was doing this gesture of kindness and I'm so used to being in control. It was like, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to knock you over there. When you say and, you swung, you mean you threw a punch? I did not. I was okay. just getting myself out of the car. Do not make this out to me. <laughs> but that's the image I did want to portray in that. I was just, you know, getting myself up out of the car and not wanting to slip on the ice and threw my arm out and caught him. And, uh, you know, when I was most needy and there was the person that was offering me the kindness and strength and support I needed, that was the person that my actions nearly took out. So that, that's, that's the craziness of that moment I was trying to get to. <laughs> I did not do it on purpose of Matt. All right, that's not what the pastor says, but I get that. <laughs> I paid him not to do that. There you go. I always do wrestle with trying to understand the power of Jerusalem as, as a character, you know, uh, in Luke, you know, the action starts in Luke in the temple with Zechariah, you know, getting the annunciation of John's birth and being struck dumb. And then it ends after the crucifixion, crucifixion and resurrection with the disciples in the temple. Uh, and, and then in between it's complex. I mean, it's, uh, it's neither, um, you know, the, down of iniquity that needs to be totally purged, nor is it like the whole, the high holy place uh, that sometimes the Psalms, you know, kind of portray the temple in Jerusalem as. It's a very complicated setting, and I, I do wrestle to understand it. Well, let me uh, let me help you out. I mean, Please, let, that's um, what I was asking for. I'm not so sure it's always fair to do this with the Gospel of Luke, but if you look ahead to Acts, I mean, it's in the Pentecost story. I think that. It's significant that that happens in Jerusalem, that the, that the diaspora is not necessarily reversed, but diaspora is given a kind of new footing or kind of has a kind of, um, I would think that part of what's going on there is global Judaism is having a, a, a reconnection to, Jeru to, to itself and it takes place in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem becomes a site then also of healing. It becomes a site by which, um, the, the, the pain of diaspora, the disconnection or the alienation that comes with diaspora is, is, is reshaped into a community. I mean, so I think it's, it's not, I'm not saying that the, that the city is redeemed or anything like that, but I think it's an important site. It's a, it's a creative site for Luke um, that then goes out and blesses the world when those same people who are reading it back together uh, get sent out or forced out more literally into, into mission. I think it's, there might be something a little bit Abrahamic about it, even though I know Jerusalem's not an Abrahamic city, you know what I mean? That, but it's, it's, this is, these are still the people through whom the, the world will be blessed. I don't know if that helps or not, but it's, I think that's part of it. And so that makes the tragedy or the loss of, of the rejection of Jesus all the more acute. Well, it is in some ways an Abrahamic city since Genesis 22 is uh, traditionally understood to have been on Mount Zion. But whether that's historically accurate or not, it's still a nice transition to the Genesis 15 reading. Well done, Matt. Okay, one, one more thing. Uh, yeah, very well done. Uh, but one more thing. <laughs> no, you're going to undo it. it. One more thing. But you're going to undo it. No, 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 no. I'm not going to undo it. I am just going to point preachers in a, a, a potentially a very difficult or different direction. And that is, uh, it's not often that we get images of God in this way, uh, of that of that protective uh, mother and hen. I mean, yeah, she, like, like you said, I mean, I'm not quite sure what kind of hen she is. She could be like totally crazy, you know, mother bear hen kind of hen. But, uh, but we do get language like this uh, in, for God, like uh, Psalm 17, 8, guard me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And so it also might be a Sunday where you invite that kind of image for God. Uh, and how how is it that that image for God might be resonating with people now, uh, one that one that we don't often see and and hear about and help people think about and what that might mean for their relationship with God and their life of faith. So uh, just totally different kind of different direction, but a way possibly to go. Genesis 15.
Yeah, here we have a turtle. Uh, speaking of images, we have a pigeon, a turtle dove, a ram, a heifer, and a female goat. Just to be just to be clear, we got like half half the half the farm. Animals of the Bible. <laughs> Exactly. So I this text, um, I think a lot of folks don't think often about this text in terms of the Abrahamic covenant, but it probably is the most important of the Abrahamic covenant texts, I think. I wrote a commentary a few years ago, probably three years ago, on, on the website uh, that's going to capture a little bit of what I say, although Justin Reed uh, also captures uh, some, but he goes in a different direction. Um, and that is that Abraham starts off, I mean, God repeats the promise to Abraham, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid means good news is coming. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. And then Abraham responds with a lament psalm. If you just took Abraham's um, two quoted passages and arraigned them and arranged them as poetry, uh, you would say, hey, that's a nice little lament psalm we could have added to the book of Psalms. Um, he laments particularly that God has not kept the promise that God has made in Genesis 12. And then as Justin Reed notes in the website uh, commentary, God then enacts, ritually enacts a covenant, um, the result of which by uh, sacrificing these animals, then walking down the trail of blood between them, and God walks down, the one making that promise is saying, if I don't keep this promise, let me become like these dead animals. And so God is promising at the cost of the death of God uh, to be faithful to the covenant that he makes to Abraham and Sarah. And I think a big theological project that I have in mind would be then to connect that with Jesus. But that's another monograph that I'll never get around to. I think of when I think of this, um, uh, what I what I wrote up here is when God tells God's own story. Um, uh, just as, as I looked at this text, when God tells God's own story, we're blessed. God puts God's own self on the line, God's own reputation on the line to fulfill the promise to bless us. Even as we complain about the timing, to use the journey language, um, you know, we're talking about Jesus spends 10 chapters to get to Jerusalem. Um, God is taking a long time in the imagination, the experience of Abraham and Sarah, but God is faithful to keep the promise, not just to Abraham and Sarah, but on behalf of all the world through Abraham and Sarah. And so when God tells God's own story, we are the ones that are blessed and not in a monographic way, Ralph, that's how we get through Jesus. Cause that's what Jesus demonstrates for us. <laughs> I love the, um, the, the description of, of how Abram gets through this uh, falling asleep that, that, you know, the covenant is made by God and God alone to God's own self, but, but also this idea of a deep and terrifying darkness descending upon him, which, um, which doesn't sound like fun, but I, I, I hear in that um, an echo of, of well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop a little Luther on all of you now, look at that, um, of faith, right? Where Luther describes faith as an ascent into darkness uh, and experience of, of darkness, that it's not all about illumination. It's not all about um, delight and happiness and knowledge. It's, it's to be brought to this, this deep unknowing and even this kind of existential uh, stripping down and so it's just, there's something that I take from that, at least. I know I'm, I'm using Luther to interpret Genesis for the sake of me today, but there's something in that, that, that I think underscores the intimacy of this moment, that it's not just a covenant that take, or Abraham's got to be knocked un, unconscious so that God can do the business. Um, but I think Abraham's still a participant in some way, shape, or form and brought into the intimacy of the moment. Um, his inability to participate is because he's human. And this is a pledge God makes 
uh, to the highest authority God can think of, which is God's own self. Um, but Abraham is, Abraham is still along for the ride and Abraham is still um, embraced in this, uh, caught up in the presence of God, which, which I imagine is like darkness and terror. Well, I, I'll, I'll, go ahead. Well, no, which I, yeah, which is highlighted, of course, in that, uh, that those initial words, verse five, you brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able. I, it, 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 that, that in and of itself is that moment of uh, extraordinary awe, which is just, you're just not even possible as a human to imagine the awesomeness, the amazeballness of God. That's my favorite word. Amazeballs. Amazeballs. All right. And I thought we were using this darkness to bridge into the psalm where the Lord is our light and salvation. How's that for trying to make a segue? Mm. Keep going. Segways are good. Always hard with the with the lectionary, but segways are good. It is. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Well, it's a beautiful psalm, and it's uh, and it's a it's a way that it, it's a way that it puts words to the feeling of being under the, the wings of the hen. And a, and what is it? What is it? How do you express what that is? What that feels like? That's what this psalm is. That's where I would go if you were building on that that image or metaphor for God and and to say that's exactly what the psalmist is describing. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. I mean, that that's what it is. So that's, um, yeah, it's one of those psalms that uh, you just don't explain. You just, you just say it uh, because it gives witness to what you believe and what you, what you feel and what you know and what you need to be reminded of. And those yeah, descriptions go ahead, go ahead. come out of, those descriptions come out of the darkest moments. They come out of the greatest fear. And that's where it, uh, once again, going through the fullness of that Psalm is promise when you are in the darkest moment or when you hold the greatest fear. And you need to be able to say that there is a God who hides me. Wrong. Yeah, I've talked about this uh, text often. And, and uh, one of the reasons I struggled at, to write the commentary for the website uh, for this uh, circle is uh, how personal this psalm is to me. Um, I've talked often when I teach the psalms uh, about verse 1a. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? And how that half verse alone really sustained me in the aftermath of my cancer uh, uh, that I had when I was a teenager. This one that then sustained me in the college years when I was um, first really a survivor of cancer. And then most recently, a, a, a close friend uh, was diagnosed with cancer and, and we turned to Psalm 27. My brother was recently diagnosed with leukemia and I was the one that was with him when he was uh, told the diagnosis. Uh, we recited Psalm 27 verse one and prayed. Um, a close friend of Caroline uh, and mine died seven or eight years ago and I went to see her the last time in the hospital and I knew, I knew at the time this was the last time I would ever see her Psalm 27, and that psalm was then at her funeral. It's the power of naming that we are afraid. When it says, whom shall I fear? It really means is, I'm really afraid. And then it talks about armies assailing us, you know, adversaries all around us. Um, and in the midst of that, thinking back to last week and the reference uh, in the commentary to Brueggemann is you have to have a place to process your fear or they will annihilate you. I mean, this psalm really helps us do that. Then leading up to a, uh, something that echoes closely with Psalm 23, um, when it says, uh, you know, I'm trying to find it now, where is it? Uh, but that it, I long to return um, to, uh, there it is, sorry, verse four. One thing I've asked of the Lord, this I'll seek after, to live in the house of the Lord 
all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord. I think that's another angle on this psalm is simply to talk about God and beauty. Uh, and this would be a totally different direction, but um, to add an aesthetic of beauty to your theology and to talk about um, God as, as that which is truly beautiful. But that's like I said, that's a totally different direct, direct direction than talking about four people with cancer. Yeah. Thanks, Rolf. I appreciate yeah. your writing on this psalm as well. I know you've talked about it a lot. Yeah. We've heard that, yeah, and the ways, the kinds of, well, the conversation, I'm just, just thinking about when you said that, Rolf, that, yeah, the conversations we've had about this psalm over the years, doing Brainwave together, uh, and, yeah, and so not only do you say that, but you've lived that of the way in which it sustains you, and so thanks. Yeah. Well, I know this. I want to imitate all of you all. Oh, really? Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me. I don't want to, I don't want anybody to imitate me, but I want to imitate you. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you. We'll yeah. see how that goes for you. Uh, I, <laughs> I was I, gonna say Paul's imprisoned when he writes this, so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> see, you. this is this is yeah, I don't want to end up there. So if this passage is pulling you during, uh, during on this Sunday, the, uh, this, in this letter of uh, Paul to the Philippians, I, I really appreciate the commentary on these three questions of Lent. I just think that and works out well to be a three-point sermon. Uh, not that I usually recommend that, but, uh, but it, it could, and it really does connect to a lot of the themes that we've already been talking about. Whom do you want to be like? What do you want out of life? And then that third question of how open are you to being changed? And that really centralized uh, not only the passage for me, but also uh, also sort of a the ethos of Lent or a sense of Lent or the meaning of Lent this year. Uh, particularly as we work our way through the Gospel of Luke. So that's my thoughts on that, which are really Frank Crouch's thoughts, not really my thoughts. <laughs> I have a question about this, that, uh, for, uh, for, especially for you uh, two New Testament uh, scholars, and that is uh, I've, been, I've worked a lot recently with honor and shame categories uh, in terms of the Old Testament, New Testament. And I was wondering... What this means in verse 21, that God will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. What's the body of our humiliation? I think Do it's I what we're living in right now. What? I think it's what we're living in right now. I think this is a, this is a reference to Jesus' resurrected body. I mean, it's I believe literally it's our humble bodies compared to his glorious body. I, so I think it's it's similar to what we see in First Corinthians 15 as this idea of corruptible to incorruptible. Um, so that's part of the transformation, right? It's not just a moral transformation um, or, or a choice for like, you know, focusing on the earthly things to instead think about the heavenly things, but it's ultimately a choice that we're going to act. I mean, it's a transformation that we're going to embody that's going to be actually um, worked out upon or lived lived into in our own in our own selves i mean i think that's what he's talking about here it's connected as well to that the idea of our citizenship being in heaven um which is not so much our legal status or something it's the the word there for citizenship i think it's pretty hard to translate it it, it kind of has a sense of a political group or a, um i don't want to say the word body but you know kind of a a, a convention or a kind of a, a group to which you would belong. And so it's it's there that our true community resides. And it's from there where we're expecting uh, our savior, who's Jesus with his glorious body. So it's kind of like this idea of the people to whom you belong, your political affiliation or your citizenship is somewhere else. And it's in a place inhabited by people who have already had their bodies glorified like Jesus. And so I think it's it's living into that as opposed to 
what it would be like to live according to the Philippian colonial system and et cetera, et cetera. I could go on, but I would bore people and I don't wanna have the last word just on that. But I think it's this idea of, of start living in light of how you're being transformed. And in the coming week, we're gonna see um, 2 Corinthians chapter five, and this idea of no longer regarding people from a human point of view or no longer regarding people kata anthropos, right? According to human standards and human things, um, but to kind of transcend all of these identity markers or transcend all of these things that provide status or standing in our own lives and bodies. <laughs>